Hello folks, welcome back to World War II TV and the third of three parts looking at Soviet losses and indeed we're touching on German losses today, not just in Operation Barbarossa, that was what we used for the title card, but in the end it expanded out a bit, frankly, because of my guest's incredible knowledge. So thank you for those of you who've stuck with these three shows because, you know, it, when I advertised it, lots of data, lots of statistics, some people like that, but some of you I know are very much more interested in kind of the personal stories and overcoming kind of uh, individual struggles and that kind of thing. But I think these three shows have been, well, we haven't done a third one yet, have been incredibly rewarding. I've learned incredibly a uh, lot about just the process of digging through all these statistics and this data to kind of come up with some new figures. So reminding who my guest is, Nigel Askey is the owner, runner, operator of the Barbarossa website that is in the description below, the author of a, seri a multi-volume series of books about this losses. And he's coming on to condense all these years of study into kind of three hour ish shows with us so i'll bring nigel in now so um it's uh good to have you back again for this third time so um Hi, Paul. i've said how i've enjoyed it have you enjoyed it as well yeah no i have it's uh it's kind of made me focus on you know how do you how do you summarize this you know this these findings into such a small amount of slides <laughs> yeah me, and, and small it's but but it, it's for, for, your, for your viewers it probably seems like a tedious number but anyway well it's no it's, it's been great but it's and it's also as you find you know it's the way means of sharing information via different media because books are one source of people's uh, information websites are another and youtube and podcasts are another way of people getting their information so i think it's uh it's important to kind of cover all those bases but we'll we'll fire up the powerpoint again and you're in charge of it and we'll kind of just get up to where we we left off yes we kind of done soviet pow's and the discrepancies in those figures and yep. then now uh, we're getting we kind of to the wrap up and conclusions i suppose but lots of so um, yesterday, yeah sorry yep so yesterday we, we finished on equipment uh uh, and, and how that correlated with, uh, yeah. with personnel. So yeah, let's start start on this uh, this next section, which is really a kind of kind of a separate uh, entity. It's really talking about a different way of trying to get a handle on the Soviet casualties during the war. So everything in Krivoshev is really based on front reports. Um, and as we said before, the big problem with that is a lot of the reports are missing, um, or they just weren't very accurate, or they were just never filed. Um, so basically, um, this is a different approach. It first came to my attention. I, I didn't even know about it until 1996. And I saw this article in the journal of, uh, Slavic, Slavic military studies, which by the way, I'd recommend to anybody who, uh, you know, is really interested in the East front. They really want to get some, some access to some Russian authors and some Russian based data, the General of Slavic Military Studies had, you know, has a whole backlog of articles and, and so on that you can access. So I read this, this uh, Ilyenko's article, and I was really interested in this, because this was um, the first time I really found out about this uh, central archive of the Ministry of Defense of the Russian Federation. So the abbreviation is TSAMO. And uh, the department inside it, back in 96, it was the Department for Individual Registration of Irrecoverable Losses. Um, turns out when you investigate, this this department went back to 1941 when it was a department of the, uh, a, or a bureau, if you like, of the main directorate for the formation of Manning of the Red Army with this GUFCA uh, acronym. So in 42, um, the GUFCA uh, became a, a bureau for the individual registration of personal losses. So a bureau is like a, a department, really. Mm -hmm. But then in, in 43, it basically expanded into a, a full directorate for the individual registration of field army losses. With, and it had eight departments then. So, it, the, you know, the Red Army was was serious about trying to get a handle on its, uh, you know, its losses and, and trying to f do some, you know, staff work on on um, where these guys are going, how we're mobilizing. Because, I mean, they, this is information they really needed. Um, yeah. So at the time, um, they were recording killed, MIA, uh, anybody who died in military units, uh, and they were getting information directly from units, but they were also getting the information from the military commissariats. Now, the military commissariats, what that is, is um, a sort of local uh, military administrative agency in each region of the, of the Soviet Union, and they, they 
administer the uh, the military aspect of recruitment and 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 I suppose registering people who you know go to the army and that's I guess the first part of the paper trail of 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 where you say okay this person exists this is their name this is where they come from and w this is where they're going they wouldn't have any they wouldn't have any knowledge at that point about you know where the per where the person was going to go in the red army because mm -hmm. even even if they were a trained reservist who'd done year, you know done their conscription two years or whatever they they would still be just drafted um now the unusual thing about this was as Ilenko described initially was that um they also kept records of deserters and servicemen sent into imprisonment and so on collaborators so these were enemies of the state as far as, as as the soviet union was concerned so if you desert the red army you you, you know <laughs> you either go to a gulag or uh, a punishment battalion or mm -hmm. if you if you're lucky but pretty much so these oddly enough were not carried as irrecoverable losses especially executed prisoners they were kind of like it was kind of a bit sort of you don't deserve the you know the, you don't even deserve the honor of being recorded as a as an irrecoverable loss right so but the, the problem with this of course is for historians later on that the, you know these people deserters which can be significant um and people who you know uh, are executed for whatever reason they are still irrecoverable losses they still should be counted um but anyway i think i think um that was relatively minor, but the, the main thing was that the TSMO was really recording millions of, 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 of people leaving their homes and, and heading off. So after the war, these, these archives were, were put into the TSMO. Um, and in the, the 46, 47, they did attempt to, to, to verify um, more information on these individuals who, you know, who'd come back from the war so they, this, they they did actually did a big did a big survey and the military commissariats went around and and you know tried to do a an actual uh census if you like a mini census i suppose of of who was who was uh returned and also they did you know by then uh west germany and and east germany were still you know everything was was they were at least communicating and um they started getting information from German sources as well. So um, by 1990, so this was an ongoing process for for really a couple of decades, uh, but but still very classified. Um, so it was occurring in the Soviet Union during the Cold War. By 1990, some 17.2 million files had been recorded. Uh, they were at that point they were detailed as individual files for each individual person. Now the, the interesting thing here is that. Kivishiv's team, when he when he did his study, and he would have been commissioned to do it, he would have known about this. So um, it, in October 1990, 88, 89 was the, when the Kivishiv's team was working on their uh, their their study. And uh, in October 90, General Gerasimov, who actually was an ex, uh, he was ex commander of the Kiev military district, he published information. On the basis of the card file index system, as it was called then, um, and he came up with this figure of 16.2 million Soviet soldiers and sergeants, and 1.2 million officers were irrecover irrecoverably lost. Of these, around three to four million were MIA, and five seven fifty became POWs. Um, and I, I, I saw that. I think it was in the Journal of Slavic Military Studies in. Uh, 2000 and something and I saw that and I went wow you know that number of POWs that's so close to the German figure right. um, which is like the first time I'd seen a Russian source corroborating the, the German you know because because streets value was 5880 and and here we are um, Gerasimov saying this this three to four million MIA some of which probably would have been PO, POWs and 5.7 million actual POWs. Now, um, the other question is, why didn't Krivoshev access this archive for, for their mm. work? Now, Krivoshev, in a conference in Moscow, uh, said that um, the chief of the TS had advised him that this 17.2 million files included a lot of double counting. 
and although the, so they were often the same individual and it, it was an incomplete set of data so they they decided to go with with uh, front reports and and so on now you know there's some validity there but i think generally it's a bit weak because right. a lot a lot of the file information was was recorded and it wouldn't have been impossible for them to, to at least do a, a you know a statistical sample of the files and find out if things like POWs in 1941 were was was in the right ballpark so they, they could have done work with the files even at that point but i think uh, Krivoshev at that time was basically um just you know just wanted to avoid the whole subject basically <laughs> yeah so and just, um, the question came up earlier from ian about illiteracy within the Soviet Union at this point. And I think it seemed an opportune moment to mention it now for, you know, and I'm going to give a kind of a hypothetical situation of, you know, a, a remote village somewhere in Soviet Union where six, six men are drafted and they go up and they, they, none of them can write their names. None of them can, you know, and their, and their name, but they've got a common surname or something. I can understand how in that situation yeah, you could yeah. end up with files being doubled up or not being counted because of, you know, people arriving at the same location on the same day without that, um, you know, previous paperwork they can submit. So it is, was literacy across the union an issue? And, and is it still an issue in terms of understanding the archives? You know, I, that's a very good question. I actually haven't really thought of that. Um, I imagine it was, yeah. I imagine certainly literacy was a, was a, was a big issue uh, pre-war, yes. Um, so the, I think one of the reasons, uh, you know, that, uh, you know these little dog tag things were so inefficient was people probably did probably didn't record their names properly or couldn't even write their names um i mean that's the ellis island thing isn't it we you know people my yeah. american friends who are studying the immigration to the usa you know yeah. incredible confusion with names at ellis island people just giving a name they could understand or giving them the same name as someone else or just misspelling it mishearing it not being able to speak the language and it's caused massive problems for people and searching their ancestry is just the 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 name that uh, that you left Europe with was one name. Mm. You get to Ellis Island and you go off out in the USA with another name. And I can imagine maybe in the Soviet Union this kind of point, that kind of same thing happening, in terms of people who can deal with documents from one part of Russia dealing with people from another part of uh, the Soviet Union who who don't understand the linguistic changes, blah blah blah, and and and, and inherently mistakes being entered in documentation. Yeah, and I'm, look, I think the other thing was in the situation in 1941 was was it was it was just desperate you know they they had to get yeah they don't care they, yeah. they they just had to get as many men anybody who had you know previous military experience um they had to get them moving fast because they had to mobilize these units within you know divisions within weeks to survive so um to be fair you know i said i think illiteracy probably was a big deal but i think also plenty of shortcuts occurred where you know forms are probably barely filled in, you know, get on the train, yeah. get to your, you know, get to your barracks sort of thing. Um, I'm probably a lot didn't even, you know, didn't even get a form and probably at some later date after the person actually left the door and, you know, got on the train to the, to the camp, then someone said, oh, you know, he's actually gone now. Well, we'll record his name now sort of thing. And he's already, you know, gone. So it probably took a while for the bureaucracy to, to catch up to the, to the actual events. Hmm. Um, so I think that, yeah, lots of reasons that they did have double counting. Yeah. But anyway, that I just it was just a thought that yeah. came to me. But yeah, we'll, we'll yeah. Get back no, that's this, a good. This, that's this a good understanding um, of the system. The, the literacy thing is a good point. Yeah. So during the 1990s, um, this database grew, um, and it became uh, the central data bank, which was electronic, obviously, and various scientific and uh, research tab, you know establishments in the USSR um, bought into this. And by this, by 91, of course, the the uh, Soviet Union uh, had dissolution had occurred so most of these institutions still you know still continued to um to carry on research in in this area um so in 95 there was this it was called the fate scientific information center <laughs> i guess they were trying to give it a nice name they 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 at that time now they stored up to 20 million files by then so again this is an example of you know some of the files have been mislaid, and I guess they've been mislaid in different parts of the bureaucracy in the USSR, and they were all they were kind of coming together. So it, it, it must have been a huge effort. Um, so ten, you know, five years later, um, there was some publication on this, and it stated that 
around 12.4 million Red Army lower rank soldiers, that's soldiers and NCOs who had been killed or died during the war, and possibly in as many as 1.1 million officers. Um, so the main thing about this was the chief of the TSMO then said, well, you know, after 10 years of, of further work, we've now eliminated double counting. We've gone through all the alphabetical card file index. And this is this is the uh, the numbers we're coming up. But notably, they hadn't included the naval forces. And of course, they hadn't included NKVD. So even now, the NKVD is a very dark area. And you'll see that later. Well, you can see it here, actually. Um, so in March 2008, um, the following was published, um, and it was it was that uh, yeah, those numbers: the 13 million lower rank soldiers had killed or died, 970,000 officers. Um, now it excludes 120. They actually dropped the number of officers, and the reason was because some of the lower rank soldiers and NCOs who had who had attained officer rank but it's still not occupied at officer position. So, so apparently that was what the, caused the reduction. Right. The, the seaman is from the Navy, but the NKVD figure is dubious. And the reason I say it's dubious is because that is exactly the same figure from the Krivoshev study. So that's yeah. the figure that goes all the way back to 19, you know, 1988, 1990, down to the nearest 100 NKVD troops. <laughs> <laughs> so right. you can see what's happened there is very likely the the file index system doesn't include NKVD data. And this is what I'm saying about the NKVD archives. They're still very dark, very shady. And I'm sure, personally, I'm almost sure that that, you could probably double that number. Yeah, that figure's numbers. only likely uh, to get larger, not smaller, isn't it? If yeah, that's, yeah. If we but even even today in you know even today in Russia, that's the figure. So um, so I'll just flick over to the next slide because yeah. that actually shows what's happening. So uh, this this is a basically a summary of of um, of the the the, stud, the state of play in two thousand eight, and I've tried to compare apples with apples with the Krivoshev data. Um, obviously, the Krivoshev data is, is incompatible in a sense because they're looking at a different um, data structure. Um, yeah. But the blue is basically the blue things on the left, talking about casualties based on individual persons. That's They're all irrecoverable. They're, they are dead. They are killed, died, executed. Permanently MI, well, okay, permanently MI, they could have survived, but they never came back to the to the Soviet Union. Um, and the first two items are lower rank soldiers. So officers are rated at 970,000, throw in the seamen and the uh, incubated water guards, and you get 1.282 in that category. So when you, add, when you add up those three blue blocks, you get 14.5 million demographic irrecoverable losses. Now they're demographic because they um, were lost to the country forever. They, they weren't just lost to the war effort, they, they, they were gone. Now that doesn't mean, that means you can't really use that directly for um, wartime losses because that would certainly include a number of, of quite a few people who died of wounds, probably you know within months of the war ending or even sometime after the war ending. Um, MIAs that just never wanted to go back to Russia and just left, you know, left, uh, try to get away from Stalin and, and the whole Soviet Union forever. And that were, there were significant numbers of those, I have to say. So that's, but nevertheless, that, that they are the minority. Um, and I think this, so we're getting, you know, we're getting close to the real number of, of irrecoverable losses now for the military. So what I've done on the right is I've put, put the Kuvishev stuff. This is from the old table one, going back right back to the beginning um, with the killed in action, died and so on. But then what he did, of course, is he said, well, this is the number MIA and you can compare that to the number MIAs. And then he used that phrase, unrecorded casualties from first months, which is sort of a catch all. Yeah. So you know, they, jail could, card. They, <laughs> they could have, they could have been POWs. They could have been MIA. They could have been killed. They were unrecorded. So, <laughs> 
I don't know if they're unrecorded. I don't know how he came up with 1162, 600 exactly, but there you go. Mm, mm. <laughs> um, but what was really neat in the Krivichev figures is he then went on later on, if you remember going back, is he then talked about these former servers and who were remobilized as the Soviet Union entered the, you know, the, uh, the uh, ex-German occupied right, remember, the yeah, Baltic yeah. States and Europe. Um, so they were then put into the Red Army, and he then says 1.8 million POWs returned. So I've had to put that in on the left to compensate for that because he's basically saying, you know, okay, 939,000 were re-recruited and 1.8 returned. So they're not irrecoverable loss losses in terms of uh, demographic irrecoverable losses. So um, I had to do a calculation. Okay, let's just assume of that 939,700, um, based on the average loss rate of the red army in the last months of the war how many of those were killed or uh, and that and so that's that number eight three nine one hundred um but the thing is the the big thing is of course is that what krivashev has done is he's fed that block back into the missing in action unrecorded when he when he does the subtraction anyway that's a bit complicated um i just check that i've covered it oh yeah i just wanted to talk about this um so the main just two points the main source of the difference is pow's yeah um again that's the biggest that and, and again do you remember this this number of three million keeps coming up and there it is again on the right three one one zero is that difference so that three million pow's mainly from 1941 and early 42 is you know, is that thing just keeps appearing as, ah, oh, that would explain it, you know. Um, <laughs> and I haven't produced, I haven't reversed engineered that. That is, is how it came out. So um, the other thing I just wanted to say was, was I've already mentioned that, you know, he, he put the former servicemen um, and POWs into there, which then, of course, reduces the irrecoverable losses quite dramatically. But the other thing I wanted to talk about was just this, this, bottom line here this this whole research into the files is ongoing it hasn't stopped but the russians stopped publishing the research some time ago um and then in 2011 ivlev this the the uh, uh, russian scholar and as i say most of this work is now the russians are doing all this they you know ivlev and um and others are the ones digging around in these archives when they can and releasing stuff when they can and he produced a, a, a report which said that um, as of 2010, as many as 15.3 million lower rank soldiers, NCOs, have now been classified as demographic losses. So that's actually 2 million more than that figure of 13. So what that is, is that's, that's the, the figure of 30 comes from only the lower rank soldiers, the yeah. NCOs and the permanent MIAs not the officers. So they're actually saying, well, that's there's, there's actually two more million of them. So potentially, uh, sorry, potentially, um, you could be, you know, around 15.3 million lower rank soldiers were irrecoverably lost, or at least left the, uh, um, the Red Army in one way or another. Mm. I just wanted to finish with the, uh, yep. So, at the, but you know, the to if if you include the Krivichev returned servicemen who are mobilised, then the military operational aircraft losses actually comes out at seventeen point two. So you know, these are these are these are um, much bigger numbers than Krivichev's. You know, they're one point six, one point seven yeah. times bigger than Krivichev in terms of irrecoverable losses. I'm a bit sceptical. I, I I haven't. Ad adopted these numbers for my um the next slide um because they're too they're too vague they're also not broken down by year and also i think a lot of a lot of them were probably uh outside the frame of the war they you know they they so you've got to compare apples with apples as much as you can mm. and i think if we take the germ if we on the one side we use german headquarter reports to get losses we can't then use a demographic. What is really a demographic study, um, and and you know, of, uh, 
to, it, it just wouldn't be comparing the two the, the two data types if you like are just different yeah. um, and this is a big this is a problem because um, uh, there's a study uh, by Overman, the German. Uh, this is a. Oh, yeah, Overman. Yeah, the, the Overman study. He he is a, he's kind of doing a similar thing, um, and the difference there is that they they're using files, but instead of instead of looking at individual files, what Overman did is he took a, like a, a statistical sample, and then said, okay, we're going to extrapolate the sample to to uh, to you know get the total number of dead. Now the um, the 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 problem with that is is if I if I use that, then I should be comparing the TSMO files worst case with Overman's worst case. You see what I'm saying? Right. Okay. So yeah. They're, they're similar sorts of data, so it's 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 uh, risky to use this for for any kind of um, analysis of individual battles or campaigns. Guess, I'm glad you mentioned Overman you know, because when yeah. he's come up in comments on previous shows I've done. He's completely marmite again. People, some people say, "Oh my God, if that historian's using Overman, his books must be brilliant." Other people say, "Oh my God, if he's using Overman, I'm not going to touch his books with a barge pole because all that information's you know, wrong." So, uh, no, people it's, it's completely it's, divided. On yeah, him. Yeah. he's either the genius yeah. who's got everything correct and his figures are perfect, or he's a, it's all wrong. So I, I don't know where I stand. I don't have enough information. Yeah, yeah, but it's it is interesting whole... that he does seem to he, the work mm -hmm. seems to. Um, spit people. Oh, it's a very it's a very comprehensive study. I don't agree with the statistical mechanisms he's used because right. I because my my view is that he his statistics. If you take a you know if, if you take a one percent sample of a population, that's fine if it's a homogeneous population. But what Overman has done, in my opinion, is he's he's taken a statistical sample in a very rapidly changing environment. So you know, if you take a, a statistical sample for 1941, for example, what was happening in 1945 is is very different. Yeah. Um, so you can't say, well, if I take a one percent sample in 41, I get X, and if I take a one percent sample in 45, I get Y, and they're compatible because they're not because the whole geographic situation is, is was different. Um, I don't know if I'm explaining that very well, but anyway. No, I'm getting uh, it. I'm getting it. Yeah. Yeah. So statistics is. I mean, I, I like statistics, and and they're a very powerful tool. But when you when you they when you do statistical sampling, you've got to be very careful how you're using it. Now, the big difference with this TSMO files is they didn't do a statistical sample. They looked at the the research took years and years because they um, looked at every file. So there's a big difference. Whereas Overman's study was completed in a very short time, statistical sample, done. Um, yeah, so anyway, so you've got to be careful using these, you know, these, but the, ma the main point to take is this 14.5 million figure here, yeah, yeah. because that's, that's really where um, the irrecoverable losses is going with the Red Army and, and, and you, you know that, that this is a way of corroborating that we're not just got crazy numbers. That in fact, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I just want to make the point. You know, I do, if you look at science, I mean, I'm looking at the the original um, reports done. Is that with science, the the good scientist is always trying to prove themselves wrong, isn't it? That's it. it's it's trying to find re, re, the, the, every evidence to, to to go against his theory. Where it seems some of the people compiling data are doing everything they can to support their views. They've got a, they've got a kind of a, the end in mind, and they're trying to prove themselves right. Whereas it seems the the only way to look at this is to constantly check yourself, constantly try and. Um, double check your maths, corroborate, cross check, and try and prove your thing wrong. And if you can't prove it wrong, then therefore it's more likely to be um, accurate. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean that's that's the fundamental basis of the scientific principle that you just described. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. And yeah, I I think no one's perfect, and I think sometimes I I think oh, funny I could get that three million. <laughs> <laughs> 
we're, 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 oh, we're all guilty. There it of is. We're all, we're all guilty of getting getting caught um, up in something that we want to get to that solution. And but yeah, you know, I, ultimately, yeah. what I, I've, I've come to admire these last three days is that you don't really have a dog in the fight. The only thing you want to do is get as close as you can to understand. Well, yeah, what and, the truth and I think is. I think you're not, you know, you're not the, caught the, up by bias. Well, the idea of the, you know, the using the equipment to try and get a number, and we'll have a quick look in this show. We'll look at demographic yeah. losses, you know, again, uh, just to see if you can get this this sort of fourteen point, you know, this fourteen million uh, irrecoverable loss. Um, and so you, you know, these different streams should should converge. Yeah. Right. So we will now move to a reevaluation of. The Soviet Armed Forces losses in the Great Patriotic War. Now, this is this is uh, not definitive. It's my it's my um, analysis. Now, for the killed, died, and MIA. Well, first of all, I'd say that um, um, it includes killed, MIA, died during evacuation, so on, irrecoverable losses. Um, everybody who died of disease, dies of accidents, and so on. And of that number, approximately 6.8 million were killed and 1.7 were MIA permanently, MIA really. Um, it, it excludes uh, when, when in 44-45 various forces like the Polish Liberation Army, I think it was called, and even you know the Romanian forces, they, they switched sides and they started uh, mm. fighting for the Russian, for the Soviets. Um, so their their losses are excluded from this. They some of them were uh, they were kind of pseudo Red Army units. So the the Red Army didn't actually disband them. So for example, the Romanian armies, but it it sort of said you know you've now got Soviet officers and you will do what we say sort of thing. And and the Romanians were pretty keen to agree because you know they they were they realized they were on the losing side they knew that so those those, those all those soviet allies are excluded from this and what about partisans because um, the same thing to my knowledge happened with the partisans and some of these units that have been that were then swept up by the red army that were kind of left on their own their own devices but as you say kind of with some red army officers but not really fully integrated to be honest no they're not included in this Right. No. Yeah. So there'd, yeah. Be, there'd be some other figures there. Yeah. Yeah. No, partisans are generally excluded from this, and uh, there's a big, big chunk of the TSAMO files. Is that's a problem there as well, because uh, who documented the partisans? You know. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's a big. That's and and the partisan war was a brutal war. I think partially it may include uh, some of these figures because some of the part some of the Soviet soldiers who were cut off and and you know. The Germans didn't capture. Then became partisan, partisans. Yeah. 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 So in that sense, they 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 probably are included in the Red Army losses because they recorded it as joining the Red Army. Um, so for the I have to say for the for the irrecoverable losses, I have used uh, these guys. This this is the price of victory by a, another two Russian authors. It's a pretty well known book actually now. Yeah, yeah. Um, it came out in 2017, and they they used they they used the TSMO files to generate the PO W numbers as far as I can tell, and they they then did an analysis of the uh, losses by year from their research, and they came up with this number for kill died and MIA. Now, I haven't I can't verify that number because I don't have access to the to the research they have, and I don't have access to the federation archives either so i've i've gone with their number i've read the book twice it's very good recommended mm -hmm. and i don't don't i don't agree with everything i don't agree with them using overmans for example but that's a separate discussion yeah. um and that's where the irrecoverable losses come from and you can see it comes out with this 14.5 magic number the magic number yeah 14.5 14 so again so it's you know now the good thing about that is, okay, they're saying that 40.5 million irrecoverable losses. People can say, oh, that's that's a crazy high number. But in fact, the Federation files pretty much say, yeah, that's that's pretty close to the real number. Mm. Now, the, you know, one of the problems with this book, in fact, one of my major criticisms of it is it doesn't do anything with wounded. 
it quotes one report from uh, Eremenko, I think it's you know, from 1942 uh, or something, which was the, but there's no, no treatment of wounded at all. And so I've had to use the Krivashiv data for wounded. Right. Um, and, and from what I can see, when I did my analysis of 1941 battles, um, the wounded looked pretty good. And also I, I looked at the, uh, the medical files and again, it's very close to the medical records. So I thought, well, I won't change the wounded because other data streams seem to concur that those, those are pretty reasonable. Now the, uh, Sickness and disease of frostbite, that is taken from the medical records. Um, and r roughly 200,000 of, of, of those died. They were, they were sick, but they died during the war. So they've been taken out of that, that, um, that category because they be, they've become irrecoverable, killed, died, MIAs. So they, mm -hmm. they basically moved across. Um, and so, yeah, we have we have this this number. The interesting thing about that now, from the medical records, is that comes out at twenty percent. And I don't even remember I said before that you know for for armies operating over long periods in the uh, mid twentieth century, twenty percent uh, sickness, disease, accidents, and so on is a is about average. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that that now works. Whereas the uh, the ten percent, the Krivoshev number was just you know, you know. just just it, Ian Carr is asking about yeah. training losses. The term training losses is not used. These would have been significant. So are they excluded or allocated within one of the columns you've already you've already brought to our attention? They they would be included in accidents, and right. those who were killed in training would be would be included as irrecoverable. Yeah. So they okay, thanks. They would be they would be included. Yeah. So we go back to our favorite bar charts now. <laughs> so I, I did the same thing as, as with just using the Krivishiv numbers. And this is interesting now because you can see that the POWs were huge in 1941. And that was the main source of loss. And it's that missing two and a half, three million block that, mm. that, the, that the current Russian government doesn't want to talk about. And even back in the Soviet days, they minimized in the Krivoshev study. So um, we're looking at 24,000 irrecoverable losses per day in 41. Wow. Um, and um, it's just 24,000 a day is just incredible. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, it, 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 my brain can't take it in in some ways. <laughs> well, that's roughly uh, two point four rifle divisions a day, um, and I was uh, interested in saying, "Well, you know, that seems like a lot." How, you know, even then, it was like, if you're losing two divisions a day, how did they survive? Because Barbarossa. And typhoon lasted 193 days from 22nd of June yeah, to you know yeah. end of the year, so that works out at um, roughly 460 divisions, uh, 460 division equivalents. So I thought, well, how did how many did they mobilize? So in my book, actually, I've done this analysis, and um, so although the Russians mobilized 884 units including brigades and so on. The brigades were very small. So they were basically just regimental size. So when you when you actually boil it down, um, they're actually what I what are called division equivalent. So so you actually get all the the forces mobilized and then you decide, well what is a division? So a division is roughly ten thousand men and it's roughly got this amount of artillery and this number of machine guns and so on, anti-tank. So then you can say, okay, division equivalent is 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 ten thousand men. How many of those did they mobilize? And it actually comes out at six hundred and thirty-three. So six, including that includes the pre-army, the pre-war army. So pre-war they had three hundred and three divisions, which were heavy. They were they were they were big divisions. But then, if you add all the forces mobilized, it comes out at around six thirty three. So, if they lost four sixty, it means that in the winter offensive, they were left with about one hundred and seventy three divisions to 
to push the Germans back from from Moscow. And uh, so, you know, 173 divisions is a lot. So then you think, okay, this 24,000, you know, yeah, it it actually fits the uh, fits the uh, the forces mobilized and what was left in December. Um, but it does, and it, and it does, it, it does. Just sorry to interrupt. It does just show when, when we talk about the various merits and otherwise of individual commanders in in that forty one period, either German or Soviet, and people debate those battles and great works, David Glantz and David Stahl and Prit Bhutan, those people there. The, the fact the Red Army were even kind of hold, you know, keeping pace, given that the losses there, it, you know, okay, you said they've still got this one hundred and seventy three divisions, whatever it was you said, but I mean, the, the, just the surviving in that 41 period was it in some ways something to be admired just to hold their head above water with bringing in all these people from over across the entire soviet union and getting mm. them mobilized and creating an army within within that time was was remarkable it was it was a, it was an amazing achievement and as i say the mobilization effort um was the biggest uh fastest mobilization ever carried out yeah. Yeah. No, no other countries come close to that. I don't, I know, I don't know if any other country would have survived. Maybe, maybe China, perhaps, could have survived China. something like this, but, but certainly, um, um, but it, it also illustrates how close they came because yeah. 170 divisions is a lot on paper, but as you can see, the German army in summer can destroy 170 divisions quite quickly. Just like that, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I'm sure you're so, talking about about you know, 19 because the other thing that, uh, that I'm looking at me that graph is the 1945 because the 1945 everything's going up again albeit very yes. by not very much but then we have to remember that the war is over by may 1945 so it's only a it's yes. less than yeah. half of a year so the statistical um data is taken from five months rather than 12. so what would have yeah. happened if the war had continued if if for any reason they'd had struggles getting over the rivers or the germans had held on a bit more and it wonders it might, does make you wonder where it would have gone yeah, in yeah. 45. Yes, yes. I mean, um, it's quite commonly known, but although the you know the Red Army was considered a juggernaut in '45, a lot of the rifle divisions were down to three, three thousand, three and a half thousand yeah. men. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it, you know, there's a whole debate. Someone asked me, "What what do you think would have happened if the Allies had decided to keep going?" <laughs> you know, the, the Americans and the and the British. Um, I think the the Soviets would have really struggled. They they their country was decimated. The, the Allied air power was just overwhelming. The 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 Soviet divisions were were bled white, yeah. And um, so yeah, even even the inexhaustible Soviet Union had run out of manpower pretty much. So I'll just switch to this slide. So this is. You, 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 your discussion kind of introduced this slide quite well. And yeah. at the back, you've got the total uh, irrecoverable losses. And obviously, this time you got the wounded, um, uh, the frostbite accidents, sick, is much more realistic now. But what's interesting, as I said, the, you know, the losses in um, 1945 actually went up to, to uh, compared to 44 and 43. Uh, but they're pretty as, as a total, you know, losses per day. It's surprisingly consistent, considering that in '43 the, the Red Army was on the offensive with quite significant numerical superiority, and then in '44 even it, it had major. As you'll see in the slides, they had around a three-to-one superiority pretty much across the whole front. So mm. they're taking pretty, you know, taking very heavy losses in '44. Even the big difference, of course, is that they are a lot more wounded and much fewer POWs. So POWs, very low, wounded going up. So with the Germans, of course, it's the exact opposite. Very few POWs in 1941, huge numbers of POWs progressively through yeah. to 1945. Yeah. No, um, it's really, seeing it like that uh, visually is, is really interesting. It's just... Um... Again, lots, lots, lots of take, lots of takeaways from this. I think people who find these streams and watch them later on, there's lots of potential uses for this information elsewhere, and in in, in analysis and, and study and understanding of the Eastern Front. It's um, it's more than just crunching numbers. It really is. It's an insight. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I hope I hope I hope people can uh, can get some value from it. Right. So. Um... 
I just want to now move on to to seeing if uh, if this whole discussion of military losses can fit into the demographic study of of uh, the losses across the whole Soviet Union. And this information is from Krivoshev, uh, the 2001 Russian version. Now, in the 93 version, they didn't include this information. So this this was this was new. Um, and in that book, they include a lot of information on this and World War One, but all the military stuff was the same. So, what this this is actually quite important. They said uh, the pop, you know the Soviet Union had 196 million population at the start, um, and that population had dropped to 170 million by the end of the war, by the uh, 31st December 45. So yeah, end of 45. Um, the um, the population of the USSR on the 31st was of those born before the war, obviously, was was 159. But during the war, you, you, you know, you had birth. So they had to factor in how many people born during the war died. And that that comes out at 1.3 million. So that's a pretty sad figure because that's, you know, that's young children and, and babies, essentially. Um, and then, of course, you have to factor in the fact that even if there wasn't a war, you'd have you'd have normal death rate. Um, mm. So when you when you when you do the numbers and you say, well, what does the total loss as a as a direct consequence of the war? Then obviously it, it, it's the thirty seven million plus the one point three million who died prematurely minus those who would have died anyway, and that comes out with twenty you know twenty six point six million. So they're saying the total human losses was twenty six point six million. Um, so we'll, in the next slide, we'll just see how that factors into the military losses. Um, they also gave this information, which was the Soviet population killed in occupied territories was 7.4 million. And then they show uh, where these countries, where these people came from. Um, and they threw in how many children. Uh, I'm not sure why they included the children, but they did. And... Um, some of these people would have been part of the Holocaust. They would have been Jewish extraction, right. um, people in the Ukraine probably, and I guess Russia as well, and certainly the Baltic states. So, they, I think, a chunk of that 7.4 is is the is, is the Holocaust story. Um, now, the Germans also shipped an awful lot of civilians back to the Reich for uh, factory work. And um, so the Soviets, uh, civilian population that went to work in the Reich was about 5.2 million. Um, and of those, about 2.1 died or never came back to to the Soviet Union. Uh, they may have died, a lot of them, yeah, they, I think they probably did die, but also they, they, they probably, uh, some of them never wanted to go back to, to the Soviet Union. The mm. Krivoshev states that 2.6 came back um and at four well 451 immigrated so yeah okay now i can't corroborate these figures obviously they are from the kivashiv study um but they you know they seem very uh realistic from from the other what other people are talking yeah. about the other the last little item was this 4.1 million uh, at the bottom which was estimate of civilians that died from repressive conditions imposed by the axis forces now i've i've taken the the words here i've taken straight out of, of that's uh, a catch-all uh, phrase ever i heard because I, I, I thought well i'm not going to change what's actually said there that's exactly the wording they used and that includes the lenin i think that includes the, the leningrad you know civilians who died in in that siege uh, right. who starved to death um, it probably also includes a lot of Soviet citizens who died in, in some of the pretty tough conditions in the factories. When the factories were shipped to the Urals and so on, they, you know, they, they arrived and, and there was a lot of places that were bleak. There was hardly anything there. The conditions were terrible. So a lot of, a lot of the ones who died would have been from that as well. Anyway, when you add the 4.1, the 2.61 and the 7.4, you come up with estimate of Soviets who killed um, or died as a result of forced labor is, is 13 point, uh, 13 .7 million. So then we say, well, how does this compare with uh, uh, with the irrecoverable losses? So 
I basically um, did this comparison. So the, the total deaths in Soviet population as a result of the war, 26. Civilian deaths, obviously 13. So roughly 12.9, almost 13 million as a direct result of the war, military deaths. Um, so comparing it with uh, Krivoshev's table, obviously there's a problem because he's saying that they took 8.6 million irrecoverables, but then in the same book, he's saying, well, we lost 12.9 million military deaths. <laughs> so mm -hmm. this is the beauty of the, of the, of the of poor reverse engineering, if you like. <laughs> you know, this is, this is the stuff you find. So in fact, it, again, it, the, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, the number is, is obviously wrong, the 8.6. But I have to point out, there's the magic 3.7 again, the magic 3 million. So because mm. if you add the 500,000 mobilized reservists who were captured before being conscripted, which Krivoshev excluded because he, he called them civilians, then in fact, you get this the difference between what Krivoshev is saying and the um, total military deaths from a demographic study, you get this 3.7 million. And I would, I would lay odds that that's, mostly the missing POWs. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And 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 of course they died in kept you know, a huge chunk of them died in captivity. So comparing it with the uh, archive stuff, it actually um even from 2000 and uh, the eight uh, situation it's basically lower than the archive. So in fact what it's basically saying is this because the archive information is also a demographic study and a much more accurate one than than Krivoshev is using it. It's actually saying that actually this this twelve point nine million is a very conservative estimate. This thirteen point sorry, this thirteen point million is a very conservative. Um, and it's it's saying that even even in the in the archive files, it's actually high. It's one point six million higher than than the demographic study. So you know that one's actually higher than we coming up. The Krivoshev one is lower. And then of course the last one, the table fifteen, we just looked at. Um, I had to subtract the MIAs and, and the POWs because they they didn't die. They you know they returned to the USSR. So um, table fifteen has uh, yeah is fewer. Mm. Wow. So in other words, it, it does fit. Um, and I, I think probably the the twenty six point six million is is a little bit low. Uh, my I haven't I can't prove it, but I think going back to the source, um, probably the total population decline is was a bit higher. In my opinion, but I I can't prove that. But that's I think that's that's that's. Uh, I mean, one what, you'd what assume that, that any of these figures, they're only going to be higher than they are lower. I mean, that, that you can't imagine them coming down, but you can quite easily imagine them being going up. Yes. Yeah, that's right. They're they're pretty much the floor, not the ceiling. Yeah, as yeah. they say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is which is tragic, really, isn't it? It is. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Wow. So I don't know. Has anybody had any questions on that, or shall I? I'll just keep going. No, I think we keep going. Yeah, people are just, right. um, just absorbed, I think. <laughs> right. So I just wanted to finish with with some comparisons uh, to the Axis forces. Um, so we're taking here, we're taking our uh, new evaluation of, of the Soviet um, casualties. Now, all the, all the uh, sick accidents, Frostbite, they're all being taken out. So we're only now including MIAs, POWs, and wounded and killed and died. So people who were, became casualties as a direct result of, of enemy action. Right, yeah. Um, and that's that's what's on the on the left side. That's straight from table 15. Yep. Um, now, this table is provisional. It's, it's, it's part of some research I'm doing right now for my next book. But so the, the numbers will change a bit. But but at the moment, um, I've had to adjust the Soviet losses against German forces for um, the German allies. So a, a portion of the, the Soviet losses were were, were uh, lost against the Romanians, obviously the Hungarians and the Finns. 
primarily. Yeah. Um, so they've been subtracted from the total. I could go into how I've done that, but uh, probably haven't got such enough time. But it's it's, it's quite an intricate. Uh, it's done it's done it for each year and basically looked at the battles and and then done an estimate of of how many Soviet soldiers were lost in those individual actions. Now with the Germans, the German figures, they are based on um, the Buddhist archive reports from OKH for each year. They've then been modified with uh, Overman's data. So with Over Overman's gives you data on the Waffen SS, Luftwaffe, uh, the Kriegsmarine, and you can see there I've added roughly 406,000 Waffen SS, 440,000 Luftwaffe, 37,000 Kriegsmarine. Um, so I've, I've then had to estimate based on the average loss rate in the Vera market how many of those were wounded. So they've had, so those are killed and wounded. Yeah. Um, so that's those figures are slightly higher than Overman's, but that's to account for the wounded. Um, well, actually, quite significantly higher to count for the wounded. So I factored those in for each year because Overman's give them, gives them for, for the year. Um, and then I've subtracted, at, as especially for 44, 45, there's a small subtraction because um, the, the Polish Liberation Army became quite active. The Romanians uh, became active. And in Finland, oddly enough, they also turned and there was there was a quite a bit of fighting when the, the Finnish pushed the uh, the Germans out of northern Finland and so on. So I had to factor that in. And so I've reduced the German losses slightly because I only want to know the German losses against Soviets. So I'm really aiming to get the German losses against the Soviets and the Soviet losses against the Germans. And then we come up with the, you know, the, the force ratio. Just one other thing on 45. Um, the figures for 45 is where Overman's is most uh, contentious. You know, he's... Right. His figures for 45 are a massive problem. And the reason is because if you follow Overman's figures for dead, for example, in the West, the British and American armies would have would have even have to commit genocide. They would have been, you know, they, they would have been, because um, he's got huge numbers of German dead in 45. And it's like, well, I don't, you know, if you read about the battles of the Ruhr pocket and so on, um, where basically large German forces were just surrendering in mass, especially in uh, the last two months, they, you know, they certainly weren't being killed. And yet apparently, and it's, it's to do with the way Overman has statistically analyzed the 45 data, I think. I don't know exactly, but, but so the 45 figure I've had to take from German um the German records from the front, and and I've added the six hundred eighty thousand POWs, which is which an over, is an Overman's figure. Um, so the, the I've had to estimate the German figures a little bit. That of, of all the ones that'll change here, that one probably could be the biggest one that changes. Mm -hmm. um, now, just to just to mention in the Overman study, which is quite annoying, is they actually sorry in. Um, the Krivishev study, there's actually a section in the Krivishev study where they, they 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 do a similar analysis. And roughly, at the, when, the, when Germany surrendered at the end of the war, roughly 2.5 million German soldiers went into captivity. And he's he's basically taken the ones that surrendered in, in the Soviet bloc, if you like, <laughs> into account as German POWs, which is a big no-no. You know, that's, that's the big no-no because... If you do that, you've you know, you've got to include all the Allied armies, all the armies that Germany occupied um, as Allied losses, because they all became POWs at the end, and that's that's you know you can't do that. Yeah, you've got to okay. draw the line yeah, that when the war ends, you know, uh, that's they become a whole different. It becomes a different environment, and I just thought I'd mention that because I. I it's, it's, that's annoyed me for years that they did that. <laughs> and um, mm. and um, it, it, I just, it, I just it wanted fell to, on your face, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was just, you know, like, um, so this 45, 45 figure, and, and, and to some extent, really the interesting part is, again, this 42, 43, 44, because 41 really was an unusual situation where the Red Army was, was desperate. 45 was unusual. It 
the German army was desperate. But 42, 43, 44 is more in line with with, with the two armies and and you know on on reasonably equal terms operationally and strategically you know fighting it out so yeah uh, you know, anyway, that's, that's, that's i'm the, immediately drawn yeah. to the loss ratios because that's just yeah. i'm finding that fascinating and yeah 44 seems to me the most normal year you know where you kind of compare the eastern front to the pacific theater or the or the, or the edo as well but the the 6.7 for 41 is is I don't quite know what conclusion I'm drawing from that, other than the Germans obviously were were, were running pretty efficiently it, to 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 suffer the re- remarkably le- less percentage of losses than their than their enemy. It's a, it, it's a testament to how we we talk about Bar- Barbarossa as being hopeless, never going to work. You know, people you know throw those throwaway comments of the stupidest thing any any leader's ever done is invade Russia, mm. and yet those figures there show how quite efficient the German invasion was at least initially yes yes no i think i think um um that's right but but don't forget look at that 42 figure that that 42 is almost as bad almost as bad yeah yeah and and the red army had 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 quite a long time to mobilize by then it also was starting to get a lot of equipment so actually even in 42 um it was a pretty bad um you know, pretty bad exchange mm-hmm. ratio. But yeah, by 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 the end of forty two, things. So this does show the end. The Red Army is improving. You know, yeah, definitely as, it, yeah. as, it, as its doctrine. So, interesting question it, from uh, um, a new viewer. At least I haven't noticed his name there before. His or her name, Ethikiel. Great presentation. Thanks again for these three streams. Did you undertake any analysis away from calendar years? Is there any difference when looking at the data quarterly or on a seasonal basis? I ha- I haven't done that. No. No, I, I for this particular analysis, I only did annual, and credit Krivishev at least has done that. He's he's split his losses into quarters, uh, so yeah, you could you can um, um, get a better picture of you know how how the campaigns were you know during the winter losses were higher and so on. So no, that's a good question. No, and I, I haven't done that analysis. Yeah, and that, and that you know like any like any good historian, the work you've done is open for other people in the future. To take it and take it to a next level and a next level and you know keep on focusing narrow and down and narrow until it, because that's how history works it's the you know one generation takes the previous generation's work and goes in with with new resources new tools new 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 means of analysis and and, and take something from it but um yeah yeah no, we'll, we'll 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 round up i'm really i'm still really really learning a lot so thank you again so the next slide is still important and this is this is um comparison of the average annual strengths at the front uh, again as the previous uh person question was it's, it would be se- it would be good to separate this into quarters in fact you you might be able to do that now that i think about it uh, so um this is this is basically the average soviet forces mobilized on the left but then it's it's the average at the front now there's a little bit of question marks there. Seems like an awful lot of forces weren't at the front, but anyway, um, um, and then I've had to adjust that for again for each year, doing an assessment based on the situations of how much of the Red Army was facing uh, German allies. So basically, then I've I've, I've adjusted the figures so that um, you get that on the left side there. Uh, so that's the Soviet forces on average per year facing only the Wehrmacht. And then again, on the German side, I've got the average forces at the front. Slight subtraction for the fact that uh, they were facing small amounts of, you know, well, Polish, Romanians, Czechs, Bulgarians, and so on. You got, uh, even the Albanians started to uh, realize the writing was on the wall. Um, so I had to reduce the German forces slightly for that for each year and then you get this exchange ratio here now this is this is actually important because in barbarossa the initial invasion force was about 3.3 million and and the uh, and the forces on the frontier were around 3.3 million so it was pretty even 0.97 mm. is basically parity so on average through barbarossa what was happening is the germans were moving east and the russians were replacing their armies so at any point in time the Red Army had about the same number of men on the, in the field um, as the Germans on average over, over the six-month period of 41. 
But as you can see, and that's the exchange ratio of 6.7. So I've taken that from the previous slide. Yeah. Um, but in 1942, the Soviets started to get uh, numerical superiority at the front in the region of 1.8. And that was maintained in 43. And then in 44, you can see it really racks up. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it wasn't just losses. The Germans were having to pull forces away from, from the Eastern Front uh, against the Western allies. They, they were, especially in 44, they were pulling a lot of their very elite units. You know, as you know, in Normandy, there was uh, was there 10... I'm just going from memory. There's like ten Panzer divisions and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, um, yeah that's and right. you know all those East, those yeah, Waffen yeah, SS. Yeah. You know the Waffen SS units, the the first I think, and the ninth and tenth. They were all pulled out of Russia. They were yeah, all in the yeah. West. So yeah, of course so that it, it that then out. you know that just that just meant um, the numbers rose even further in the Red Army's favor. So um, when you the first thing to say about this is that. People talk about, you know, if you want to attack, you need a three to one superiority. You know, that, that old yeah. nutshell. Yeah, I was just going to mention that myself. Yeah. Well, well, you can see here when the Germans were attacking in 41, they didn't have that. They didn't have that. And yet they were able and, to inflict the loss yeah. ratio that's there. It, it, it's my yeah. takeaway so far yeah, of this yeah. is, is just how not successful is not the right word, but seemingly closer to being successful Barbarossa was than I think my perception has been of it. I think I buy into too too much of the it was hopeless, it was never going to work and all that. And and you know the the looking yeah. at the fact that the forces it's... were fairly equal there when they went in there. Um they did a remarkable job, the Germans. I mean horrible and <laughs> but yeah uh, no look well you know uh, they were they they had practiced they were by 1941 they'd honed it to, they knew what they were doing. To, yeah uh, and their army was so experienced. I mean, with what they'd done in Europe, they, you know, they they were they just they'd had on the job. Whereas the Russians, if you like, they were they were having on the job training. Unfortunately, you know, so the Russians, the the, the Soviets, I should say, their soldiers were having on the job training against a you know, relatively elite army with you know years of practice and training. So that that's 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 yeah, the reason. It's, 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 but, it's but nevertheless, a lot of the, the lot of the Soviet units were also dug into dug into defensive positions. So that's a big advantage, and uh, even because that's when you really need that three to one superiority. Yeah, and yeah, no, the reality is that they had numerical parity pretty much across the front, and yet they achieved a six point seven to one kill ratio. That's not sure. There's many armies have ever achieved that. I no, it, it it is. Um, I'm not going to say it's something to 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 admire, but it's something to take note of. Just the the efficiency there, because the Blitzkrieg in 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 France has kind of been not dismissed a bit, but the 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 way people wrote about it in the 70s and 80s has kind of changed a bit now, and it was not anything like as well planned and things. But when you look at Barbarossa from this statistical point of view, it, it it's it's it is the achievements were remarkable. But yeah. And then in '42, obviously they were outnumbered, uh, roughly two to one. But in '42, don't forget the uh, the Wehrmacht also conducted major offensive operations. So in 1942, they were conducting offensive operations, and they were outnumbered one point, you know, one point five, one point seven to one. That's true. I mean, they, yeah. they did they, what 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 they did. The way they did it, of course, is they denuded their forces from elsewhere on the front to try and concentrate, you know, their uh, their, their forces for Case Blue. And then launch their offensive. But th having that superiority of the Red Army having that numerical, but you can see why the Germans said, "Well, trying to attack Moscow in 1942, it's you know it's going to be very hard. Maybe we can attack the, the Red Army where it's weaker in the south because we mm -hmm. don't have the numbers." And and that's that's those numbers kind of you can see how they were thinking. Yeah, they'll try and go for the Caucasus because Moscow will be too strong. Uh, but even in 1943, they launched the Battle of Kursk. Um, and as you know, Glantz and House points out in their excellent book, you know, when the Germans attacked at Kursk, they were the inferior force numerically. Mm. Um, again, uh, the German army, as much as you may hate them, they were one of the only armies ever to be able to conduct consistent operational level offensives when they were actually numerically inferior. Um, yeah, then, it's, it's undermining my. You know, then, I'm a big yeah. defender. I mean, we're going down a rabbit hole now, so anyone can drink if they're in the right place in the world. But you know, we talk about the fact that the I, I'm a, a, a 
proponent of the idea that British and Canadians weren't particularly slow in Normandy, this idea they were slow and laborious is kind of an 80s and 80s kind of historiography. But actually, now I'm considering the numerical superiority the Allies had, not on June the 6th, it was about fair, equal on June the 6th, but within within a couple of weeks, the Allies are sort of two, three times numerically stronger than the Germans, and yet the Germans held on for 76 days. And you're looking at what the Germans achieved. Okay, the terrain is different, the scale is different, you can't make a complete fair comparison between Normandy and the Eastern Front and Barbarossa, but what the Germans achieved as the aggressors with a force, as you said there, of, of only equal size compared to what the Allies achieved in Normandy with a force three times stronger is is it's an interesting comparison. And I'm I'm yeah, I can un- I can understand some criticisms mm-hmm. more of the Allies in, in Western Europe now when you look at what the Germans achieved. Well they just I just wanted to end on one one last point and that is um this is personnel. And I've also started an analysis using equipment. And unfortunately, it, it actually gets worse because when you actually factor in artillery and tanks and aircraft, the numerical ratio actually moves even further in favor of the of the of the Soviets. Wow. Yeah. So um and if you do any kind of operations research on this, you've got to factor in what they call heter- heterogeneous forces. And that means you've got, you can't just use personnel, you've got to use weapon systems. So if you factor in weapon systems as well, unfortunately, because can you, you know, in, for example, in 1944, the Russians had a massive superiority in artillery. And they, used, they, weren't, they, they weren't very good at indirect fire operations. The American artillery became superb at, you know, um calling in artillery yep. via radio indirect fire and so did the british by 1944 45 they were they were better at it than the germans were and uh the soviets were really the opposite they they never really perfected indirect fire so they used to mass their artillery into these artillery divisions and fronts and they would just power the hell out of the front line um so when you factor in the the amount of artillery and the and of course you know the Russians produce these huge number of tanks which we talked about yesterday, um, and at the same time the German factories were being bombed by the Allies, German strategic production dropped by forty percent in forty four, that included all Stugs and tanks. So the tank ratio actually shifted much worse than this. So in fact when you factor in equipment, it actually gets even worse. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Well, one, right. one more table to go, I thought. Two, one more, <laughs> two more tables. Yeah. Yeah. So the last table, I just thought I'd throw in this just to finish. Um, basically, um, this is the sort of casualties that, uh, that for the Western Allies in World War Two, and um, so this is this is deaths, wounded POWs for the entire war for these countries. So the USA's losses include everything in the European theater and the Pacific theater. Same with UK, and then you've got the Commonwealth forces. So you've got it, you're getting around a million deaths, uh, you know, 1.2 million wounded and so on. So I thought, well, you know, just to, just to uh, throw in the, the last little bit, what were the, I picked four Russian operations, four Soviet operations in 1945. Um, the famous one, Bagration, um, the Budapest one to, to, Capture Budapest, East Prussia into uh, Eastern Germany, and then the final one, Berlin. And these are these are from Krivishev, of course. Um, and as I said earlier, the Krivishev stuff later in war is pretty accurate from what I can see. Um, and yeah, you you get this figure of uh, two point two million casualties, and you know four hundred sixty thousand deaths. So in the last uh, ten months of the war. The Red Army took more deaths and a lot more wounded than the entire U.S. war effort, and that mm. in, so imagine that includes you know huge battles in the Pacific, the European theater, Italy, um, you know over from from four four years of warfare. So that you know the the Red Army took those losses. Now these are not German figures. Don't forget these are admitted losses from, yeah 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 and it's from and it's not just the figures it's the percentages um, that, 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 are, that are screaming out to me there yeah yeah, yeah that's right strategic offensive 44 percent casualties that 
Yeah, that's yeah. that's insane. Well, um, that, that is the start strength. So there probably was some forces yeah. added, but no, it, yeah, that's the percentage of the start strength, and and it's that's very high for an operation of, of that duration. Um, so yeah, that's um, the end at last. I hear you say. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's been really good. I mean, Thanks we for watching. Had, it's not so much a question; it's a comment. We did the show about a year ago with Sasha Todorov about the 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 Red, Ar Red Army's artillery um, and they're saying that we should watch that show again because Sasso did an incredible job of, like you did with data, looking at the amount of ammunition produced, saying it wasn't about, his expression was it's not it's not the, the it's the bandwidth. He kept using the expression bandwidth to terms in terms of the artillery. It's you can have all the tubes as, as yeah, you want. Yeah, there's yeah, not yeah. enough shells for it. It means nothing. Yeah. And, and the well, I think it's, uh, there. there's a famous general, I can't remember who it was, they said uh, an artillery uh, weapon is uh, 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 artillery cannon is not a weapon. It's the shell that's the weapon. Yeah. So exactly. in other words, yeah, exactly it's just a lump. Of, it's just, yeah. Yeah. It's just a lump of metal and less. And, and, less and like yourself, he know. wasn't. You know, you well, uh, you not like yourself. He he's a lawyer by trade, and and but he's good at data. He's good at analyzing yeah, figures yeah. and facts. And so he he came at it not as a military historian. He's you know he's only young. I don't know how old he was, but late twenties or something. And his work, you know, Red Army God of the Artillery, Red Artillery Red Red God of War, I think it was called the show, mm. I, was extraordinary. His analysis. Analysis. I just want to say one last thing, if I can, and that's yep. that's um, when you when 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 some, someone like me produces these numbers and they go, oh, you know, um, just going back to this one, for example, there's a little line here. I said, uh, uh, roughly 75% of the Wehrmacht casualties were on the Eastern Front. So there's a tendency then for people to say, oh well, you know, uh, the Rush, the Soviets would have won the war anyway. And that's a big, big mistake. That's a big mistake. Because um, I can tell you that, uh, in fact, I might even write a book on this one day. There is no way the Soviet Union would have won this war without the Western allies. It, it, well, lend lease yeah. alone. I mean, lend lease yeah. alone. And then you've, and, and the other thing, of course, is those casualties were what you might call the lowest level. So, so, the vast majority of the Luftwaffe was destroyed by the Allied Air Forces, for example. Yeah. So, you know, they're fighter pilots. And by, so losing a fighter pilot is, is unfortunately more damaging to your wife than losing an average soldier in the field and so on. So, the, you know, the German u boats losses were a huge, yeah. something like uh, out of a 900 or something. I'm just going from memory. You know, they, they produced almost a thousand submarines. And I did a quick calculation uh, once to work out how much steel that took. And I realized if they if they scrapped all the factories making U boats, they could have made an extra, you know, five thousand Panzer fours or something. You know, yeah. it, it was. And then I saw another statistic about uh, ammunition production in 1944. And something like 30 percent of German ammunition production in 1944 went into flak units defending the Reich against strategic bombing. So that's a third of all German ammunition production was trying to shoot down allied bombers so when you factor in not only lend lease but the strategic bombing the fact that so much of the vera cross was sucked into normandy and, and the west um then, then dean is saying you should do a book on the lend lease figures nigel is dean murphy is saying yeah so. there's a couple of uh there's a very good one here uh it's called hitler's uh, the life so let me I if i can find it uh yeah, no, I can't find it. It's, uh, it's, it's I, I know where my books are roughly, and then I keep yeah. moving them. But yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, called, the, it's called it's uh, called uh, Russia's life, oh, the Soviet Union's lifesaver or something, and it's an excellent book on lend lease. And, and I, I'm thinking of doing at least a week yeah. on lend lease at some point next year because I've got two yeah, or three yeah. presenters already yeah. lined up who've looked at it from various angles. Yeah. some from the American econ economic point well, of view. Well, I, I, I can, t I can tell you straight off, one. straight off from memory that. Uh, I did some work on that, and and I found that something like sixty percent of the Soviet truck capacity was was based on land lease trucks by nineteen forty five. Yeah, right. Yeah. And over, I, I, over over over, I think there was a thousand locomotives. So the U.S. shipped um, almost all the locomotives that that were used as replacement locomotives in the in the USSR during the war. Something like a thousand. When I saw that, I thought, my God, because making locomotives is hard, and and 
most of them came from there. So lend lease was massive. Yeah, it was massive. Yeah, and and we and that's not even talking about the the, the assistance we gave, like with the industrial diamonds and the te and the techniques they took to their factories, which wasn't so much stuff but expertise yeah. and advice that they they yeah. took on and, board as and, well. So uh, there's simple things like food concentrates and stuff. Right? Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah, yeah that we, we we've got that. Well, I yeah. don't think that will be till at least next year now. But a week on lend lease will be really good. Yeah. I'm glad so you mentioned the strategic bomb. I just I just wanted well. to just to you know just just to clarify that even though you know these German figures are massive and 75% of them were on the Eastern Front, don't then make the mistake of thinking, oh, well, the, you know, the Soviets would have done it. In fact, an analysis shows in, that, that not only would the Soviets not have done it, they would have actually been in a lot of trouble. They probably wouldn't yeah. have even survived. So it's a big mistake to sort of go, oh, the Soviets won on their own because that's not quite right. Well, it's the it's the we, for, for fear of going down a discussion we can't get out of. It's that way that history always has to swing back and forth, and when it swings one way, it swings too far the other way. So we for years it was yeah. the Western authors didn't give any credit to the to the. Uh, the, the Soviets at all, and then it kind of swung back the other so way, saying no, they won the much. war on their own. Now it's yeah. going to swing back again, and mm. then it'll end up settling the needle somewhere in the middle, saying what they did was important, what the Americans and Canadians and British did was important. What the, it'll all it'll all even yeah. itself out. But it's well, I, I I kind of like to think of it as a three legged stool. So you got yeah. the, the Soviets, the Americans, and the Commonwealth forces. And if you knock one out, you know, it kind of falls yeah. over. That's Absolutely. kind of you know. Uh, People have to realize that you know the the, the German uh, the Wehrmacht and the Luftwaffe were, were extremely powerful war machines, um, and yeah, it really needed the three, you know, what I call the biggest empire in the world, the, the most powerful economy in the world, and 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 the country with the biggest armed forces in the world to defeat it. Pretty much, no, definitely, yeah. absolutely. Well, yeah. I think that's a good way to end it. So we we talked about what you're working on now. Can continue this volume, the, these studies of of, of, the, of the campaign, the statistics, and and as far as I'm concerned, you have an open invitation to come back. I've made a note on my list about the um, German armored division efficiency because I think that's a very interesting um, uh, aspect to look at. So um, we, you're, you can come back whenever well, you want. As far as I'm concerned, great. Well, thanks for having me. It's been great. So I'll just take your screen for a second and bring you back in a moment. So one more show, and it's at the earlier time of 6 p.m. UK tonight, not 7 p.m. Wendy Goldman is joining me to talk about something that just came up today, the movement of the Soviet civilian personnel east to establish the factories away from the front line. So Wendy Goldman's book um, has been highly regarded uh, by a lot of people. She's a socio-political historian rather than a military historian. So like, like Nigel Day coming at it from a different angle. But Wendy, I'm looking forward to speaking to her later. So 6 p.m. UK. And then I'm off for three days. And then next week we start with the Pacific and we're back into naval actions and Air Force actions. So James M. Scott is on. Um, Jeff Dacus about the Corsair squadrons. Lots of stuff coming up. I haven't listed them all yet on YouTube, but they will be very soon. Um, so there we are. I'll bring Nigel back in to say good evening. And where you are, you can you can go and have a drink now. It's lunchtime yes, for me. But you can have, have a, a, have a gin and tonic, yeah. Have a, have a sniff <laughs> that. And it's been in, in, great to get to know you. Great to understand your, your process. And I think all of us have learned not just about the subject. We've learned about the, 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 the process as well, which I think is fascinating. I think people will take well, away some of these learning love, tools love, and use them elsewhere. Doing it. So thanks very much, everybody. Cheers, everybody. I will see Bye. you all again for those going to be with me at 6 p.m. UK tonight. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Bye.